going to use these V7s for the small, because obviously the small are smaller. The small has to be around a chubby 13 centimeter small in order for us to tag it. So there were some rivers in Cape Breton and stuff where they didn't catch any smolts that were large enough to tag. It's just the beast on one of them have a bigger smolt there, but some rivers have here what I would consider very small smolt, and New Zealand we have a lot larger smolt, but they're a lot older. The smolt here, you know, will smolt at two years mostly, and in New Zealand Labrador it's more like three, four, and in, in Labrador it's five. So New Zealand's three, four, and Labrador's four, five. So they're older and larger. They grow more slowly. <coughs> so the small tag is smaller, yes, less fatty, it only lasts three months. So we can only really get that in the initial migration period of the small, so over three months. And it has to swim within 500 meters of it. So the bigger the tag, the larger range it has around the receiver. So I was thinking these fixed receivers, needle in a haystack in the middle of the ocean, I am going to spend $12 million to get zero data. That was my fear. So for small, all you can do is acoustic. Because this is a satellite tag. So these are the satellite tags that we use on the kelp and the adults at Greenland. It has a harness. You'll see a picture actually with them on the back of the fan. It goes over the dorsal fin, wires go through, and you tie it up. I don't know if you ever seen like a parallel tag and stuff. It's very similar to the tags in the past. And then this is set for release at a certain date, and it will pop off, float at the surface, and send its data. So it's not super cool like a shark comes, because when a shark comes to the surface, you can name your shark Susie. Every time it comes to the surface, it sends your data, so we know where Susie is. The salmon never come to the surface. So you basically put them on, and you don't get the data until like whenever a year later, or six months later, or whatever tag pops off. A lot pop off before the program. So yeah, so they're not as cool, you can't really market them to people like name your salmon because there's no live stream for the fish. <coughs> um, obviously this here is actually being as prompt as This is actually a tag we're hoping to put on a kelp at a PI this weekend. Well, you're tagging for some of those that are returning. Uh, are you also collecting DNA to try to determine where these fish have originally? 100% they'll be in here. Oh. Yeah, we take DNA samples from all any kelp. Like a cow, obviously we know what's from because we got them in the river. Yeah. But with the fin clip, we take it to do sex. So now you take a fin clip and say whether it's male or female. Yeah. Now, great that cows have a type, and any, anyone can sex a cow, but for, <coughs> for fish coming into the river, especially we do all of our sampling programs now. But at Greenland, we sample every fish to know where around it's supposed to be going. There's 12 areas in North America that we have genetics for. That's not yes. We, yeah, we have a genetic database. We can break North America. I mean, obviously, the USA is one of the 12, because they have like five fans left. But then there's like 12, like Labrador's three. Northern Labrador, Lake Melville area, Southern Labrador. We can say that we can break the Labrador to three pieces. Newfoundland is like another four pieces, and then, I don't know, Scotia, it's the, the Gulf, Quebec, and Eastern. I think Nova Scotia Shore is two pieces. Anyway, there's 12 pieces in total that we know. And I'm actually, my, my 100% of my job is this project, and I am a senior science advisor to Ottawa for Atlantic Salmon. So I work on the NAS profile, which means I do the assessment of salmon in the whole North Atlantic, like with Russia, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, the UK. We all do the science. And then we go to the political meeting to negotiate the Greenland fishery. And we sample the Greenland fishery every year and run the tissue sample from the Greenland fishery. And 80% of the fish harvested at Greenland go to North America and 20% go to Europe. Um, that's basically the West Greenland. Sorry, West Greenland. East Greenland is, there's a little yeah. tiny fishery because it's not populated. There's very few people, and it's the opposite in Greece, Greenland. It's 80% European, 20% North American. It's the opposite. And the European fish show at West Greenland are the United Kingdom and Ireland. Most of them. We get a spread of kits from like Norway and Iceland, but most of them come from the United Kingdom and Ireland. Whereas this is the Canadian River where we tag <coughs> salmon. Um, we tag on 42 rivers. So the St. John River is one river, even though we did like Nashua, Tobias, and Hammond. That is Maine Sand. 
So a lot of places we tag on tributaries, but we only consider it one river. So my river number has changed a bit, because, you know, you understand what I mean, because it's three rivers, but it's one in here. So it's a lot more rivers than 42. So we did 679 kelps, and we did 4,627 smolts. We did, as part of the project, Mark Trudell works at the um, St. Andrews Biological Station. He does the hatchery smolts and puts them in the Nacanita River, and I get the data for that too, for the offshore part. So that's where the hatchery smolts come from, from that. And then in Greenland, and this is over three years, so 2021 to 2023, we tagged 264 um, salmon at Greenland. We only tagged in Karakatak, one community. We did go to Assistant Community, and it's more about um, there, it's just, you know, getting the connections with the people that fish. And we have a great connection in Karakatak, so that's where we've done all of our tagging. And it's this, I, I have it there, but it's the south west. This is going to be on here, actually. It's right there. Um, very small community. I don't know how many people, I don't think there's like 3,000 people, but it's, it's, it's a pretty small community, <coughs> but we have great relationships there. But we did do two, 264 with satellite tags and an additional 122 just with the acoustic tag. Now, a lot of the satellite tags on kelp in the fish at Greenland. Sometimes we would put the internal tag in, the acoustic tag. If the fish was good to go, we'd flip it over and put a satellite tag on it too, so they're double tagged. So a lot of these fish, kelp, and adults were double tagged. Next slide, please. Um, so just for this presentation, we're traveling everywhere. This sort of will give you sort of a more details on the coastal <coughs> rivers, but then I have high level information from all the rivers that we tag on. So of course we did the Macadavic River, but those are the hatchery fish from the Macadavic hatchery, and then Hammond River, but we also tagged on Nash Rock and Toby. Next slide, please. Colors look really weird. I'm not gonna go into detail, but you know, the Hammond River, there were 10 kelp, two in 2022, and we actually got no hits from these fish. And then there was another eight fish in 2023. So we do have eight off those fish. So there was um, eight kelp, Four had just acoustic tags, or six had acoustic tags, and four were double tags with the acoustic tag and the satellite tag. The Nashua River, we did 69 smolts in 2022. All smolts are only acoustic. So Beef River, another 70 smolts or hatchery smolts, and then the McDavid River that Mark Trudell did. So we're putting all these tags in the ocean. How are we ever going to find them? So the method you can use is what I said, that's the receiver there. It's not that much bigger than, it's about, you know, a little bit heftier and a little bit taller than this, the receiver on the left. Those are the anchor receivers, so they're fixed. You have to pop them up, get your data, drop them back down again. But we also have gliders through the ocean tracking network. The top one is the wave glider. There's actually somebody who drops it in Halifax Harbor. I always say it has joystick, because I think he does, well, he probably doesn't. But they have to pilot it 24 seven. They drive this thing around. The European's going to sit there and move this around. And it has a receiver on it. So if it hears a fish, any fish though, because there's, like, there's cod tags out there. There's halibut tags out there. Like there's a lot of projects using this technology, but this lot, this, so we're paying for this. We decide where this thing goes. I'll show you real quick. We drive it around, if it hears a fish, it sends the information on the fish number and when, where it heard it, lat long time. The one on the bottom is called the Slocum Glider, so that's the exact same thing, that's piloted 24-7, <coughs> you can set it at depth. So you can have that, if you're looking for cod, you go down deep, if you're looking for sand, you keep it near the surface, and you pilot that around, and that's the same thing. It collects data, you bring it to the surface, every so often you download your data and you sink it back down again. The other option is a drifter. So a drifter is just a float at the surface, the receiver hangs down, you drop it in the ocean, and it just goes where it wants to go. Wherever the waves and wind takes it, that's where it goes. And it's same thing, it's listening for the fish, and it sends its data live if it hears a fish. So those are the methods that we used to try to hear all these salmon that we tagged in the ocean. This is my map of everything we did over the three years. The yellow circles, which are everywhere, are the six receivers that are anchored to the ocean floor. 
I did not buy all of these receivers, obviously, because they're everywhere. There's a lot of projects going on. But they all collect the same data. So everybody shares the data. If they hear my fish, they get the data. If I hear their fish, they get the data. So the only ones that I put out are here in the offshore oil and gas area. All the other receivers you see here are part of other projects. This is a northern cod telemetry project paid by the cod fishing industry. They're fighting over whose fish are whose between offshore and inshore cod. So they're putting a lot of money into this. That's their receivers. The reason the blue line here and the yet and the green, I don't know what color it is, but they're blue and red and green. I say I'm colorblind too, but they're not able to very good here. Um, this was our 2022 pass, the blue line. We sent the wave glider on the surface and we looped around the oil and gas throughout the whole summer, the spring and summer for the like the migration period of salmon. Then the next year is the green line. We actually sent the Slocum glider. I don't know if it's know. This is the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. This is the Flemish Pass. It's really deep. The banks are only 200 meters. This is the Flemish Pass. So this is sort of the area of concern where we have that. And this, these receivers right here, that's actually where the active rigs are. So that regional assessment area is huge, but really there's only active oil and gas activity right here. Beta Nord may or may not go at some point, and that's up here. It's very deep, so they're going to be doing the new drilling. But the, in 2023, we had the Slocum Glider leave the Flemish Pass, and we had the Wave Glider leave Newfoundland, and they crisscrossed the whole summer, listening, so sort of trying to create some sort of gate to see if we could detect the salmon as they migrated. In 2021, we dropped 10 drifters here. Problem with the drifter is you drop it in. I can see. You drop them in, and they go. And as you know, some years it's warmer, so the smoke leaves May 6th, and the next year it's a bit colder, and they don't leave till May 6th. So the timing is dependent on the year and the conditions in that year. So if you drop these receive these drifters, and if you drop your drifters, you've heard one fish. So if you just don't get the timing right, and you can see the red lines here, this is where the drifters go. We got great oceanographic data from oceanographers. We're super excited, but we didn't get a lot of value for our money, so we never decided. Okay, next slide. Um, so I'll just go through the different rivers. The first is the Nashwalk River. This was smoke in 2022. Just to show you sort of a high level of what we did get, we detected 14 of the tags in the river. There were some receivers in the river. We tagged. Um, we got 12 of the 69 tags on the Halifax line. I have to go back to the previous slide. But the previous slide, there was those yellow receivers that come out from Halifax that go right to the Scotian shelf edge. So when I say Halifax line, it's the receiver line that cuts across from Halifax right out to the Scotian shelf. And we detected 12 tags there. What I found interesting is those 12 tags that we detected at Halifax were not, there was only one of these 14 that is included in this 12. So it's not like 14 fish were detected in the river and we heard 12 of them. We basically heard 12 of the 69 fish and only one was heard in the river. But I'm not exactly sure what the receiver we were kind of have to spot as those freshwater receivers in the river. Like they're not my receivers, but I did get the data. So I know they were heard in the river. Um, then we got two tags here at Fort Bay. You can see the dates. They were tagged, you know, late May. Then they were detected at Halifax mid-June late June on the south coast of Newfoundland, and then in the Grand Bank. So when I say regional assessment area, it's that area there. And then two tags on the Grand Bank in, where is it, first week of July. But then if you add like, the next slide. This is just zooming in on the fish that we actually detected in the offshore area. I thought it was kind of cool because um, the fish on the left had 3639. Um, so he was detected on that southern receiver on July 3rd. I have the time. Oh, I didn't tell you this. These tags, they make a sound at a random interval between, say, 120 seconds and, and a minute, two minutes and like four minutes. It will be randomly throughout that time period. So you can get hits every like two minutes and you get another hit four minutes later. Like, so they're randomly beating and you'll get those hits. Because if two tags beat at the same time, the receiver gets confused and won't 
for the data. So you kind of want random hits so they don't overlap. So then you can see the time. So we got hits between 1.27 a.m. and 1.54 a.m. That could be like 20 hits. Then we got it again at two receivers north of that on the same day, but um, whatever hours later, I calculated it. And then I could say, okay, from their last hit at the southern receiver to their first hit at the northern receiver, that's 23 kilometers apart. And if I calculate the time, the fish was going at 1.9 kilometers per hour. Now granted, this fish might be like kind of swimming in circles. Like I don't know, but that's what I would calculate. And I actually Googled it if you look up like even Pacific salmon swim speeds and all that. It was like, oh, two kilometers per hour. I'm like, well, that's pretty good. But I think it depends on what current fish are weighing in, you know, or, or width. I mean, to be gonna, gonna matter. But then the other fish, number 4481, it was detected in the south July 1st on the northern receiver there, which is 36 kilometers away, and it was traveling at 2.3 kilometers per hour as its minimum speed. On that tag 4481, I should say, also was one of the fish that did hit off the Halifax line. So 4481 hit off the Halifax line on June 12th and then was in this offshore area July 1st. So just even tagging on, even though sometimes we're going to get a few tags on one river and then a few tags on another river, once you build it all together, you get like, you know, they're all kind of doing the same thing. They're all going to the same place. They're all going to the buffet and the lot of receives. So if any of you, you get to see the general patterns of all the rivers that come out. Okay, next slide. Um, this is just a Nashwalk. This is the, this is the tag that hit off the Halifax line. So it was tagged on May 10th. It hit off the Halifax line June 6th, and we detected it on the south coast of Newfoundland June 25th. So as we're going, and I'll look quick, like all the rivers so far, it seems like, you know, they're coming out. They migrate at the same time. It seems like they all hit Newfoundland. They actually go into the bays of Newfoundland, like they go into Placentia Bay. So they hit Newfoundland, they bounce around the bays of Newfoundland, and then they go out and swing around up with the offshore. So as we're tagging more and more, we're getting sort of a general picture of what the patterns are from certain regions. It's region specific. But okay, next slide. Um, so we're at the Tobique River Small. And the same thing, there were sea fish tags, they are factory fish, so may not be like, you know, the 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 designer wild salmon. They're, you know, might be a little bit have well supposedly have less survival rates, but so 70 were tagged May 8th to 9th. Um, 12 of those hit off the Halifax line. One of those tags also hit off a receiver at Cape Breton on June 20th. Then there's receivers just off Cape Breton there. They hit off those um, mid-June. And then there was one hit on a receiver up there around the Cabot Strait on June 22nd. But we didn't hear any of those fish. If it's not here, well, this is kind of not true. This is 2023. I dropped the receivers in the ocean, and a year later I go get them. So we talked them up last week. We got the files today, and I haven't looked, so they could be in the offshore area because I don't. I have the data just now. So we drop them in the spring, and we go get them the next one. So any fish tagged in 2023, I do not have a specific data yet for the offshore area. So we're always a year behind. We tag them, we wait a year. We tag them, we wait a year. Um, this is, yeah, just an example on the right there, the fish that hit off the Halifax line and then off Cape Breton. It was a distance of 293 kilometers, and I boogied, in my opinion, was 5.9 kilometers per hour. That it was, so, it also depends, the ones in the offshore are going, like a lot more currents coming down and splitting, so I'm sure it's a much easier swim along the coast. Okay, next slide. <coughs> Okay, Hammond River, yay! So we didn't get any data from 2022. But for, from the eight tags in 2023, we did detect three on the satellite, three acoustic tags on the Halifax line. One of those was also a double tag with PSAT tags. So obviously, 2023, I don't have the offshore hits yet. If any of the tell me that the offshore, I wouldn't have data yet. But next slide, I do have some satellite tag data. <coughs> satellite tags, I can't say I'm sold on a satellite tag. Like, satellite tags for Greenland make sense. Because they're in Greenland and they're migrating back. Some kelp will leave the river for six weeks. Recondition and go right back to the river. 
So you wouldn't have my tag on, it's coming out with this little circle and it would be wrapped and put right back in the river. And other cows will go to sea for a year and will come back. But also the tags, like, they kind of randomly pop off. Like we double tag fish, so we got satellite tags that popped off. And then the acoustic tag came back to the river. So the fish lived, it didn't die. It lost its satellite tag, but came back with its acoustic tag. So double tagging fish does give a lot of value. I'm more sold on acoustic telemetry than the satellite telemetry, unless you're looking at the scale from <coughs> Greenland to Canada. That's the kind of scale you need the satellite tag for, not for like a CMU project. But we two popped off in the river for whatever reason. I don't I never heard of tags afterwards. But then this is a ta satellite tag, this is another reason you look at but satellite tag popped off here, and satellite tag popped off there. So this one popped July 2nd, and this one popped May 24th. But I have tons of details about those actual satellite tags. Can you go to the next slide? This yellow line, this is the Halifax line that you're talking about. This is the receiver line that OTN manages called the Halifax line. This green dipsy doodle, so that's one of the kelps came out and dipsy doodled around and then the tag popped off. This is the red line is the other one, it kind of dipsy doodles around. It goes offshore and then it pops off. So I kind of know the general migration pattern of those two kelps in the hand. Next slide. this time, 
And the PSAT track says it was here, because that's the only dot. So you can see the PSAT track has dots, so I can actually click on those dots to get estimated dates and times. So basically it was here on June 13th, around midnight, and it was there on June 13th. Around. So it kind of gives, you know, some of the math that goes behind some of these tags can be a little bit scary. So I like it when the PSAT tag data says it was there, and the acoustic data says it was there too. It puts much more confidence in my data. But I am surprised that I didn't get a hit here. Now, if there's one hit on one receiver, we delete it. Because there are random hits of tags. Like, I know a tag is in Labrador, I'm getting great hits on a receiver every three minutes. 100% that fish is there, and all of a sudden I'm getting data that says it's in Quebec City. So there are random hits, but it's one hit. So all the one hit wonders we have to delete. If I got, this is Jesse Lilly, she's supposed to stop working with me. I could get Jesse to go back and say, I'll just look at the raw data and see if there's a random one hit wonder here. Just for fun, and we might have a one hit wonder there. But we, have, we delete it because it's not worth keeping in the data. It messes up the data set. But we can go back and look if we have a question about it. Because I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't have some sort of one hit wonder in there. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the PSAT tags have depth and temperature. So it takes, you know, the temperature reading and it has a pressure sensor. So the pressure is depth as it goes deeper, the pressure sensor gets pushed, and somehow it kind of knows where it is and you can calculate at what meters the tag is. So the left figure here is depth. This is the depth of the ocean floor. So you know it's about 200 meters, which is what it is on the shelf. So the orange line is actually the substrate, and this is the fish tag. So as we know, salmon are generally in the top five meters. Usually when I get a hit, they're like, you know, four meters to six meters. And then they do these deep dives, and this is known from publications. So 200 meters, they do dive the deep, and that's sort of known, there's lots of publications about that. And it's fine, so it did a bunch of dives, you get those hits, but then it's, you know, back at the surface. But then we can look at the temperature. So as soon as you plot this, the same dates, the same, this is its depth, and this is its temperature. So the temperature goes from five to say 25 degrees, the orange line is the sea surface temperature. If you go to like weather.com and you put, you know, look at sea surface temperatures or something, it's a satellite image that does something pokey that knows what the sea surface temperature is. Somebody coded something and a satellite image can tell you what the sea surface temperature is. This is what the weather oceanographers say the sea surface temperature is, and this is what the tag reads. So obviously, the fish is at the surface, so it should be the same as the sea surface temperature, and it is, right? There's a sea surface temperature and the tag are the same when they're at the surface. This is the sea surface temperature, and all of a sudden the tag spikes to 25 degrees Celsius for a bit, and then it's at 25, and then it drops instantly to water. It got eaten. That kelp was inside of a tuna or a shark, and then it got pooped out or spit up, and it's back in the ocean. So that fish got eaten. So, I mean, this is also, I don't know what your kelp survival rate is. I mean, we have the kelp survival from these numbers of 50%, so I don't, usually your percentages are a lot lower here. Like, if we have 10 kelp, leave a river, five come back. So, and same with overwinter, you get 20 adults in, 10 kelp come back. But that's very river specific on your overwinter survival in the river or the estuary, and then how many in return is very sort of population specific. So, this guy's eaten. So that's where we're running tags went. And 25 degrees Celsius, I thought was tuna. But Mark Cudell told me today there are certain sharks around here, and they're also 25 degrees Celsius on the inside. So big fish, warm, that sort of thing. This is the other kelp that came out and was just, oh, actually, this is the one that went offshore. Remember that's the greatest number? <coughs> this fish here, that's the one who just came out inside of Bay of Fundy. So it's just, you can see the date shorter. It's like May 20 something. That's the one that just sort of came outside the Bay of Fundy and got popped up. The next one is the one that came out and went offshore and popped up. So same thing, this is the, um, the scale is huge. I, I, I should, I'll just explain. But so the, the same depth, this is like 200 meters, because this goes to 5,000 meters, obviously. <coughs> it did go off the shelf edge, I don't know what the depth is, but that's not where the depth, that's not where the depth comes from. Basically the fish is at the surface, it does have the deep dives as well, because this is 200 meters. All of a sudden, the pressure goes to 5,000. You have to remember this pressure tag is a pressure tag, a force tag. 
as you go deeper, it gets worse. But if you look at the temperature, I'm not sure what was going on here, but you can see the temperature matches pretty much. The sea surface temperature, and then the temperature, this is sea surface temperature in the yellow line. I don't even know what that is, is it's sea surface, but it's not. I'm not sure where the satellite one was going to, but anyways, it spikes to 25 degrees. It was heat up. And I don't know if the pressure was pressure as in physical pressure being in the guts or being in the mouth or something, but that all, can also got to the line because it's almost 25 degrees Celsius. The air temperature is really about 16, so it's not. So both of those fish can't be eaten by a large something that has a warm belly. Um, this is the McAdavid that's the first Mark Trudeau from the S Bottle at the St. Andrews Biological Station. So these are the Maxipac um, hatchery fish that he puts in the McAdavid River. He tagged 150, and the only hit from those 150 that we have, and this is 2021, so we have the offshore data. We did get two of his tags here in Fortune Bay, and one of these two tags was also detected in Placentia Bay. And they're going in the bay. So again, like the Nash Rock facilities, um, we've done a ton of tagging on um, Eastern Nova Scotia as well. And the same thing, they go out, they hit Newfoundland, they actually poke around the bay and then come out and they'll swing out around. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is my high level slide. The left slide is smolt. The little white smolt is every river that we tag smolt on. And the arrows are just the migration routes, but these, these are all the rivers we tagged on. These are the only rivers that we detected east of Newfoundland. So say for this question we're trying to answer, really what we're trying to ask, answer is, which small migrate through the Strait of Belle Isle, and which migrate east of Newfoundland? Because if you migrate east of Newfoundland, you're in the oil and gas zone. So which populations migrate east of Newfoundland, and which populations migrate west? So the arrows I have is basically the only populations that go east of Newfoundland. So most rivers in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the small migrate through the Strait of Belle Isle. The uh, Bay of Fundy and eastern Nova Scotia migrate east of Newfoundland. The south coast of Newfoundland goes east. This is a 2023 river, so we don't have the data yet. So we don't know if Granny's River will go east or west. Um, the region I have the arrow here, this is Western Arm Brook. So the, obviously the smolt went through the Strait of Belle Isle, like it's there. The Strait of Belle Isle right is at the, the, the river. But they actually, when they migrate out, you know, the lateral current comes down here and it actually splits and comes this way too. And they kind of dip down, they were detected in the oil and gas zone. One interesting thing is, yes, all of these populations, 100% went through the Strait of Belle Isle. This is the Marguerite River. 90% of the small tag at Marguerite River were detected at the Strait of Belle Isle. 10% went east. So the majority of fish went through the Strait of Belle Isle, but some do come out and swing east. <coughs> St. Mary's River is the opposite. 90% of the small from St. Mary's River go east of Newfoundland. 10% deep back in and go out through the Strait of Belle Isle. So no fish goes like 100%. Like they're the only, and we have tag everywhere, but the only, the only examples we have so far for that is the um, St. Mary's River and the Marguerite River. We also put a lot of tags on there as well. So, And then the right figure is all the rivers where we tag kelp. And obviously the smolt is three months. We're only getting the outmigration of small. So for three months, we'll get hits, and then we have no idea what happens. Whereas the kelp tags last over a year. So therefore, we're getting the kelp outmigration and return migration. Of course, we get the return migration. It's the same year. But if they go out in one year and return the next, we get it, and that's what it is. The white lines are the outmigration routes. So specifically, the Restigouche River. Kelp and the Restigouche River migrate out through the Strait of Belle Isle. And then following the year, they come back east of Newfoundland. When they go back home, it becomes apparent when they do that. But other, otherwise, it's the same trend as what you see with smolt, except for that we're getting that whole year. So out through the Strait of Belle Isle, and then back east of Newfoundland. Okay. 
Um, Peggy and Greenland, two times over three years, 21 to 23. We had three separate teams go, and um, we used trolling to catch the fish. So trolling and spoon, best way to catch salmon. They're about this big, about this deep. And um, yeah, I can't remember what I said before how many we tagged, but there's a lot of effort putting in to try to tag fish there. We actually have 50 leftover satellite tags, so we're going to send one or two crews this year with the satellite tags on again this year. Okay, next slide. Oh, this is a video play. It. This is a fish being released in Greenland, and there's the satellite tag. So just to show you the fish size versus satellite tag for fish in Greenland. They're, they're rather hefty. Okay, this was your question about the genetic part. Okay, this is a video I put together of every trout that we have a PSAT track for in Canada and at Greenland. So soon you're going to see in the spring, of course, we do tell the dates at the top. So it's starting in April 2021. You'll see the date change at the top of the screen. You're going to see a bunch of dots come out of rivers, and you're going to see the tracks. And the tracks stay. Once the fish tags pop up, I left the line. Then you're going to see all the fish in the fall, because we tag it fall after the Greenland fishery, which ends around mid-September, because we don't want to tag fish and have it harvested. So we tag from mid-September to the end of October. So in the fall, you're going to see the dots coming out of Greenland, then you're going to see the kelp the next year. I've done two years of data so far, and all the lines will stay. I'm going to remove this. Well, if you tag your kelp, you know what river it's from, unless you got it every day. But mo most kelp we know are from a specific river. But this is the region, so when the dots come from Greenland, this is the genetic result. So when we sample, when we tag fish Greenland, we ran the sample and say, okay, we know so that the regions are here. So the rivers are here too, though. So the specific rivers are here, but then like Labrador South, Gulf of St. Lawrence, Gas Bay, um, Eastern Nova Scotia, United States. I'm just looking for the regions. Western Newfoundland. So the genetic regions are here too. So we have the dots coming from Greenland, they're colored, and that means we know that fish is coming back to Southern Labrador. So we kind of know where it's supposed to go. So I'll play the video and you'll just see the habitats that we're using. Oh, and also the fish at Greenland. And you can tell you that includes the fish from Europe as well. But I didn't take those out. I'm like, oh, no, I have to go. Sorry, go to the bottom of the slide. Just go. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So those are the kelp coming out. And of course, it's warmer in the south, so they come out earlier. And then you got the green line fish coming out. So I was really surprised. So all those fish, the sea between Greenland and Iceland is called the Erminger Sea, and North American fish are in there too. Yes, there's UK fish, but there's lots of North Americans. So they, they use the habitat in the Erminger Sea a lot more than I thought they would. The really light color is zero degree water. Sorry, I should have told you the color is water temperature, the scale is on the right. But the really light green, that's ice water is zero degrees Celsius. So that's the whole video. So if I look at it now, I know for sure, just because I know, <coughs> this fish is assigned to the United States of America. Um, I think that's a Labrador fish. No, that's the UK fish. These are Labrador fish. So you can look at it, and we have all the data. But basically, if you look at that video and you study it like I kind of, you know, the fish will, of course, kelp come out. Some kelp come out, do a little circling the way. It's very boring. And then some kelp, as you can see, if a kelp, if a kelp migrates as far as this, it's not going back to spawn that year. If a kelp decides it's going to spawn <coughs> this year, it's not going very far. So it just kind of comes out. It might come out of Eastern Nova Scotia, so do a few loops and go back. But if it migrates up towards like the Labrador Shelf, they're not coming back to the same year to spawn. They're going out for a full year and coming back the following year. The fish from Greenland actually, you know, they, we fish in a fjord. As the water temperature drops, like it, how much temperature are there? Well, it looks all around it, but our last year was like six. Uh, yeah, maybe even colder, like four. Four. Six. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is like end of October, and then the water hit like two. Once the water tops drop below well, two, the fish just leave the fjord. Salmon have, like, codfish have really high egg degree protein, so they can pretty much freeze in the water. Salmon have very little egg degree protein, so they can't freeze, they'll die. So they, if it starts getting around two degrees Celsius, they gotta get out of Dodge. 
And you can see that when they get all the fish are in like the fjord and the water temperature drops, they pop offshore. Like they have to get out of there with cold water. So they're moving in, they went from like say two degree water within two days, they're in like five degree water. So they're definitely avoiding really cold water. Then they hang out, they get seasons around for a long time. They come out, say, in November, and then they swim around, and you can see all those paths, the Army and the Sea, the Lagos and Sea, till the following spring. How is it possible that all went so tall with the Army? But it's like spring and it's getting kind of warmer. Once they decide to leave Greenland, they're going home. So they decide, once they start sort of migrating into the like toward like a lot towards then that they're going. And so they'll come back, they actually hit the shelf edge, and I have another thing, but they actually swim across and they hit the shelf edge. And I'll show you the next slide because it's my temperature. Well, I'll explain the first one. We have an oceanographic modeler. So of course they know lots of the ocean, right? They know like temperatures and they do weather profiling, they do climate change things. So we have a, a a model with the oceanographers know if I put like a dot on the ocean, they're going to tell me what the sea surface temperature was, all that stuff. So we have all this information about what the water is, the current, the temperature, the salinity. And then we have all this data from the tags. We know the, de the temperature that the tag said it was, and so where that was. So we have all the tagging data, where it was, when it was there, what depth it was, what temperature it was. So we're basically saying, okay, why, or why do salmon move to certain places? So you're basically trying to develop like artificial intelligence to say, okay, when is the family going to migrate based on water temperature or current? So this is what she's doing. Comparing the oceanographic conditions to where the salmon are and why they might be there. But just next slide, because we're actually comparing this. So now we're comparing tags. But you can see here, this is the shelf, this is a lot of our shelf edge. The little dots are the computer model. So you're telling the computer things that you learn from the tag. You're telling the computer that if I drop, I'm just going to take a ball or a plane. If I drop a ball in the water here, and I tell that ball it's going to swim to this start. So I got a ball in the ocean, I drop it here, and you change the date. So basically you say, okay, you're going to leave Greenland April 1st. You're going to swim towards the star. You're going to swim at either 0.3 meters per second, 0.5 meters per second, so some sort of swim speed range, you have to feed it some information. You're going to tell it that it hates water under 2 degrees Celsius, or 3, or 4. So if the temperature is under 4, it moves to warmer water. If the temperature is above 16, it avoids it. So the ball is only allowed to go in water that's between 2 and 60 degrees Celsius as it goes. You're going to tell a ball it's not allowed in water under 30 meters because that's land. Because if you tell a computer model, it doesn't really know. So anyways, it keeps, it keeps the model from putting a particle on land. So these, this is, if you set this, said basically they're going to leave Greenland April 7th. This is their swim speed. It's going to go in, in water between 4 and 16 degrees Celsius. This is what the model tells you the fish is going to do. The big circles is actually what the salmon did. So this is just sort of a graph on can we use math to predict where the fish are going and when. And so this is just a graph so far. But you can see that the fish swim over, hit the lever of the shell, they actually bounce down the shelf. They follow the shelf edge. They never go north. They don't come across to Canada, swim down the shelf, go up the shelf, swim down. They come, they bounce down the shelf edge, and then at some point they come onto the shelf, because you're going from like whatever, thousand to 200 meters. The shelf is freezing, so it's ice covered, it's freezing. So they're, they're in, let's say, four or five degree water. The shelf is zero. It, they're not going on to it. So they bounce down that zero degree water ice wall, and then when it warms up, they come in. Um, and this is just on the right side showing that that one, okay, it's least April 14th. It's just the way the math works. And at some point, we'll get the math that, wow, this is, in general, this is when and why the same would be and where they are at certain times. But next slide. So this is just to show you, this is April 2022. <coughs> Again, it's the satellite sea surface temperature that they know. But if you, she calls this, this is, her name is uh, Christiane Dufresne, she works for DSO at the Bonjolini office. She's the mathematical wizard. 
She calls this a cold pun. The pink is zero degree water. So it's April 20, um, 2022. So the cold time, the shelf is freezing. Obviously, this is, I don't know, green. It's around four degrees Celsius. So the lab color C is about four degrees Celsius. The shelf is zero. Sort of not going on with it. So that's why they come across. They hit this cold tongue. They bounce down the shelf until in May, you can see the tongue recedes. So the, the, the ice goes and the water starts to warm up from the to the north. So the cold tongue recedes. She's now calling it four open door closed. If you arrive in April, the doors close. You're not going in. If you arrive in May, the doors open, you'll swim out of the shelf. And so you can see the right one is the differential. So it's basically the temperature difference between here and here, here and here, here and here. And here. And you can see this is like the ice wall. So it's a very, it just highlights where the temperature difference is the most. It's the shelf edge, obviously. You can't go from thousands to two hundreds of times of having a huge difference in temperature. Yeah, so they won't come on, and this is why they're not coming back through the street at all. Uh, because by the time the tongue recedes, you're already down here. So you're coming down, you're bouncing along this cold wall. By the time the door opens, you're coming through here. You're not going through the icy cold waters through the street at all. At all. So labrador populations as well will come down, bounce off the shelf edge. As it recedes, they come in, go to the coast, and then swim back up north. They might be from here. They don't hang out here. They'll follow the edge, come out of the shelf, and then swim back home. It's kind of going anywhere beyond me. But, okay, next slide. And this is one of the questions the oceanographers are trying to address about it. They can predict what they think is going to happen in the other 2080 to 2099. So this is all the climate change predictions, what's going to happen. We know the Gulf Stream is slowing down. Right? We know the temperatures are getting warmer. The Gulf Stream is the elevator Greenland, so I'm not sure what's going to happen if we know elevator Greenland. But it's just showing this is on the left panel is what the ocean looked like from 1986 to 2025. This is annual temperature, so it's very broad. And then this is 2080 to 2099, so it's going to warm up a lot. The cold water here is going to really recede. So maybe in the future, that will have a huge impact. So she's actually going to model then this is my fish migration stream now. What if I say this is the temperature in the future? How will that impact the migration rates? So that's one of the things she's going to work on as well. I think that's it, is it? Yep. And we have a Facebook page, ESRS Atlantic Salmon. <coughs> so that's it. That's what we have today. <laughs> so a lot of work.
that are full of power. You convert just the, the transponders and receivers that we place in the ocean. Do you recover all of those? Yes. You, you lose some. some. I mean, you lose some parts. They lost, we put 285 on shore and we lost 14. So that's not bad. So not bad. I mean, you're thinking, the thing we do is, I mean, Brent Munson, a friend of mine had an ESRF project. It was on cod and side like years ago. And of course, if you're taking cod, it's in the cod area where they fish. And so, fishing gear will also remove, and they are really bad if they hook one of these things, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the EMS system, you know, for a commercial vessel, we know where you are all the time, so we can plot these tracks. And what I do is I plot at that area, and I actually put power receivers where people don't fish. Which I thought was kind of risky, because if people fish there, it's probably good to have it at that time. I mean, I'm thinking my receivers were saying, well, I'm not going to be. But we did a pretty good job, because I didn't think they would swing that far west. Like, I think I found a really swing right out west. I actually thought they'd come closer to New Zealand than they do. But since I'm learning, the lava stream comes, the lava repair comes down, I didn't know this, but it comes down and it actually parts. One goes kind of close to New Zealand, and another part, and they kind of swim off the middle. So, they're passive least resistant. But these are just things we're learning about. But we did get a ton of hits, like St. Mary's River, I don't have it here. We actually did get a lot of smoke in the offshore. St. Mary's River, a lot. Um, New Zealand, South Coast. That mainly is St. Mary's River, Lagades, or the eastern Nova Scotia, and South Coast of New Zealand, we did get a lot more small offshore than the actual mm -hmm. we were going to get. So. But the fixed receivers were definitely the best bang for a buck. So. Would never use, well, I'd never use satellite tags again in Canada. I'd never use drifters. I'd never use the gliders. The gliders were not worth the catch. Yeah. Because if you're just moving, there's just something about them. They detect the cod in certain areas. So I knew they were working. I was afraid I spent all this money and they just didn't work. But they did detect other tag fish, just not salmon. Yeah. Like I thought that would be such a good idea. Really, if I had to do it all over again, I would buy way more fixed receivers and use those. Right. Way better for your money. Do they hang the, uh, their position? Or, or do you, you keep the coordinates when you place You have it. to know where it is. And you hope the yeah, anchors you can hold yeah. and everything. Yeah. 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 And so it's pretty good. It's only if, if there's really yeah. strong, like you guys have issues here. If it's strong tides and stuff, but if it's a soft bottom, I'm like, you never get it back. Mm -hmm. right. like, you kind of have to know where you're putting it. Right. Yeah. So that's great. But we did pretty well. We didn't lose that many for the amount that we put in. Right. So. And the ones we did lose a lot of them, the floats actually broke.
smoke and other fish come out. But if there's no habitat, it's like our most familiar with water. So we have rivers in Labrador that don't have a lot of lakes, that are deep, like a deep lake, for, and, or even just deep pools, but you know, rivers are deep. Unless you have a deep pool, or if it's groundwater fed where it's a little bit warmer, the fish won't stay in the river. So we have rivers in Labrador where all the adult healthy overwinter mantra rivers, there's nowhere for them to go. And then we have other rivers where none leave, and they all go, like, you can see them one where we have this massive trench. You go over the helicopter, and it's like a black trench. Like, the fish are literally jammed in this trench for, like, a kilometer. So there has to be habitat for them over winter. So think it's river specific. Rivers that have lakes, so I know nothing about the Hammond River, but a lot of rivers that have lakes, they used to come out in better condition because they actually feed in the lakes before they come out. So, yeah, so I'm not, you guys have a lot of or do they usually come out looking horrific? Like, wow, okay. Well, specifically because of sex, they haven't been in the river since we were the one feeding, so that's helping you. Yeah, they will start, they, sure, they've been in the river since, but then ours will feed the next spring before they come out. On the way out. On the way out, okay. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. Right. I'm saying that if they spend their uh, in river life starts in, say, June, the early month there. Right. Uh, and they're off their feet for a period of five, right. six months I guess, the yeah. I guess it depends where the fish are too when they come in in September, like were they feeding up until September in the ocean? Probably not until September, but, but yeah. certainly later. We have like, like okay. a fish or, or a really big, bright fish. Okay, yeah. And so they are likely, I'm not saying for sure, but they're likely to receive monitor. They're reaching yeah, they are. Yeah. They are, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. the reason is the fish are the ones that come in last. So they have their, if a grill sort of like multi sea, obviously you should come back with an awesome. But the grills can come back, you know, not looking as good as a reconditioned yeah. health, right? Well, and they come in really a thing. Yeah. Good right. side thing. Yeah, so they didn't go very far. No. So they go out, but they will feed them the hot day until they come back in September. And when the water, like sometimes I don't know if it's in the universe, but a lot of our late friends have too, there's that gap between like kind of the early when they can get in, and then they can't actually get in the river in like late July, August, because it's water so low. They have to wait for the fall rain to bring the river up and then they go in. So But it's very like it's like when people always say, I can say they can all. Like there's always an example of some weird population that does something different. So, um, I don't know if we want, we have prizes. CFO never gives out prizes, but I call it, I call it field support. So I brought field health support. So we have, I think, does everybody give their name to Sarah? Did anyone not give their name to Sarah? Okay. I got your name. Oh, 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 I travel across town and talk. The only reason I'm allowed to go is because DFO has an agreement with the oil and gas company, so I have to take the green line. Otherwise, there's no chance they can improve my travel here. Like, there's not a chance. The names are here. Okay, so we'll start with the best prices.